Good morning, everybody. My name is Bob Willemson. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Valley Church, and I'd like to continue the, the moment of just ministry, right? I, I want to read Psalm 103, and, and while you're doing it, don't even open your Bibles yet. Don't open that app, Kristen. I just, just hold on. Sit back and let this minister to you as I read it. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. To those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let me front load with this. When we are frustrated, sad, or anxious, the powerful path forward is praise. When we are frustrated, sad, or anxious, the powerful path forward is praise. That doesn't mean you have to be powerful. It means as we praise God, as we start by praising him, wherever we are, that's the powerful path forward in his power, in his strength. So I have a pop survey in here. How many of you are morning people? Listen to me, how many are morning people? Like, boom, you wake up, okay. And, and you're just like ready to go, you're happy, you're energetic for the day. Okay, how, how many of you are like, ugh, like, come on, who's, who like it takes a while to get this thing in gear? About 50-50. Okay, raise your hand if the person next to you, no, don't, 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 do, that. don't do that. I can go either way. I really can. Um, I can have some dark mornings. I can have some gray stuff going on in my head. I can have some moments where I wake up and I feel the weight of the world. I could be sad, frustrated, or anxious at times, but I have learned over the past 14 years, and I'm going to tell you a story about 14 years ago in a little bit, how praising God can stabilize a lot of that. Creating a habit of praise can stabilize a lot of this. So let me back up just a little bit first. Over the next several weeks, we as a teaching team are going to be teaching through psalms. It's just not the whole book. There's 150 of them. But we're going to grab several psalms, and we're going to teach through one each week. And the book of psalms is that big book that if you split right in the middle of your Bible, you open it, you'll find it. And the book of psalms, as we said, is 150 chapters. It was written by a lot of different authors. The most prolific author was David, King David. He has been attributed to at least 73 of those psalms. Other writers of the psalms include Moses, actually, who wrote Psalm 90. Some people you've maybe never heard of, Heman the Ezraite, Ethan the Ezraite, Solomon, Saf, and the sons of Korah. Several of them don't come with any credit. But the cool thing about the psalms is, like with David, for example, usually you can pick out the psalm and you can find in the historical books of the Bible, like, for example, in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, where you read about David's life, you can see what was going on in his life, and then there are psalms that he wrote in certain seasons of those life events, of those life events. For example, Psalm 51, I believe he wrote after, after his relationship with Bathsheba. So if you're ever feeling really bad about yourself, just read Psalm 51 and know you're in good company, and you can find comfort. And praise there. 
Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, quotes a references of Psalms 14 times. The New Testament quotes a references of Psalms 75 times. So it's a pretty profound book. It's a pretty profound tool for us to look at figuring out maybe the nature of God and what God would want for us. So Psalm 103 is what I just read. So why did David write Psalm 103? I have no idea. Okay. So all of that being said, it's really unclear what exactly was happening in his life. But what is clear is he wanted to praise God for all that God had done and all that he knew God was. And so as we get back into this, I'm going to start going through verse by verse. Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Okay. So what's it mean to bless God? I was talking to somebody within the past six months, and he said, well, I went to some church, and they were saying things like, bless the Lord, and we bless you, God, and all this stuff. And I was like, well, whatever that means, how do you bless God? You know, he thought they were wrong for doing that. Well, the problem is we just don't always have the proper understanding of what it means to bless God. Let me read a quote by a pastor and theologian basically named John Piper. He says, my thesis is that in in scripture, when God blesses men, they are thereby helped and strengthened and made better off than they were before. But when men bless God, he is not helped or strengthened or made better off. Rather, man's blessing God is an expression of praising thankfulness. When the Old Testament speaks of blessing God, it does not designate a process that aims to increase God's strength. We don't help God. It is an explanation of gratitude and admiration. So we bless God when we lovingly praise him and when we give him credit and when we place our faith in him and our trust in him. And praise is one of the best ways to place our trust and faith in him. He blesses us, well, when he (laughs) makes us capable of walking around this earth, right, without completely unraveling and falling apart with so much more. Let's continue. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And I still remember the trip almost exactly 14 years ago. Tim and Chris Kuhlman are the room. We served in the youth ministry 14 years ago. And we had the brilliant idea, okay, it might have been my idea, my idea to have a trip, a, a youth event called 48 Hours of Madness. Middle schoolers and high schoolers leaving Memphis, going to Arlington, Texas, spending the day at Six Flags, doing some other fun things, turning it around and being back by 48 hours later. Great idea, right? That won't happen again. Well, I don't know. I don't know, Jake. No, so, but I, I, let me tell you about this trip. I'm just, can I just say it? It was miserable. <laughs> we rented some 15 passenger vans and, and Tim drove one of them and we had another SUV there and it was 48 hours of misery. Kids were mean to each other. There were bad kids. Kids, okay, like, we're at Six Flags. There are check-in points. Where's this kid? He's an hour and a half late. And then he shows up with $600 worth of toys hanging on him or something like that. <laughs> there were kids mean to other kids. It was, there were bullies on the trip. It was terrible. So then we stayed at a, at, at a, at a farmhouse that was owned by a family member of one of our families in our church. And, and literally there were cows there, and the cows were giving birth like that night. And so this is a long night. So I wake up in the morning beside myself thinking, it's Sunday, I have to do a devotional, right? I have to do something, and we're driving home today. And I look through a cup of coffee up at the field, and a couple of our kids are chasing the cows across the pasture. (laughs) What were you doing? I was trying to tip them over, but they wouldn't let me. No, they're going to run from you. Like, this was the trip. (laughs) And so I'm like, God, you're going to have to give me something. And I open this verse, bless the Lord, O my soul, and, for, and all it is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And God spoke to me that morning. And here's where he spoke to me. I don't believe David felt like praising God right here. Why else did he speak to himself in third person and give himself a pep talk and try to convince himself to forget not who God was? And all of his benefits. And it really ministered to me. And I think a couple of weeks ago, I heard Andy say something about talking to himself. He does that when he works out. 
And when he starts talking to himself, just get away. Just let him be. Just, just, it's, it's time to go. All right. I talk out loud to myself a lot. My wife, Christy, will often say, what are you talking about in there? Who are you talking to? And now she does it mocking me. I could be giving myself a pep talk. I could be rehashing a conversation I had with one of you last Thursday and wishing it was going better. I could be reminding myself not to forget something. It could be a lot of different things. But it's interesting that one psychological study showed that 96% of us talk to ourselves. And 50% of us talk to ourselves out loud. So it's okay. There's... There's a thing that's biblical self-talk. If that's you, you are in good company. David talked to himself a lot. King David talked to himself a lot. We see it in Psalm 103 here. He's literally telling himself to praise God, this weird third-person interaction. This isn't the only place he does it. In 1 Samuel 36, which is one of the historical books, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You know, he's encouraging himself. He's talking to himself. This doesn't mean he has split personalities, although I did see a meme recently. It's, it's a guy sitting next to a girl, and he's like, I'm looking for a girl with a great personality. And her reply is, you're in luck. I have several of them. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about here, okay? That, that, this isn't what this is, but this is a third-person interaction, right, where he's convincing himself. Psalm 42.5, another one that he wrote, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? He's self-reflecting. He's trying to figure this out. He's he's analyzing himself. He's almost having this out-of-body experience where he's communicating and trying to figure himself out. And this is a really healthy practice. But a lot of us don't even want to go there, right? Because it's easier just to stay busy or it's easier just to be angry because that's a safer emotion than some other emotions we might feel. This cast down here is profound. It's related to the sheep. Right? If a sheep, remember David was a shepherd, if a sheep was cast down, it could not get up on its own legs unless the shepherd came and found it and lifted it up. And apparently David couldn't either. David had to encourage himself to do it. And I wonder if this is why David made a habit of praise. Psalm 119, 160 through 164. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Seven times a day I praise you. He made a habit of praise, whether he did or did not feel like it. And I think there's value in this because feelings are fickle. Feelings come and go. God made feelings, yes. So it's okay that your spouse has them, all right? And you can validate them. And even if you don't agree with them, it's okay. God made them. But feelings are data about our life, not direction for our life. They're data. They're data points to use with everything else. We need to use those data, but we don't have to be absolutely enslaved to those data. And here's why. Because we are a lot more likely to praise our way into a feeling than we are to feel our way into a praise. If I wait to feel like praising God before I do, I have given 100% authority and control to my circumstances and feelings. And it's not wise of us to give away control. But if I decide that I will be a person of praise, whether I do or do not feel like it, I have taken 100% agency over my feelings. And now I can partner with God or I can tell myself how to engage with God and I can work towards a better path forward. I want to say one thing before we move on. This doesn't mean forced praise in spite of our feelings. I'm not talking about forcing praise to to avoid feelings. I'm talking about praising God through the feelings. I'm talking about praising God into the feelings. Praise is not a form of escape or self-medication. It's a form of healing through. If, if, If this thing in front of you is a brick wall, it's not about praising God around the wall. It's about praising God as you dismantle the thing so you can move it out of the way or have the perspective on it that helps you move forward. Praise is about remembering everything that God has done. David reminds himself, forget not all his benefits. Verse 3, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all of your diseases. He starts to remind himself what those benefits are. Now, this forgives all iniquity here, uh, 
this, and it heals all your diseases, this could be a, uh, referring to physical sickness. It could be. Often it's uh, a metaphor for moral and spiritual life. But as these two pair together, this forgiveness and healing, uh, it, it might be likely that the context that David was talking about was about this moral healing, right? This, this spiritual healing. And the physical too, but then he goes on to keep talking about this spiritual and moral healing. In verse 4, he says this, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles. These two verses speak of God's constant care and provision for us on our way. David's remembering this. This is remembering that God wants good things for us, not just things from us. He gives us the strength and encouragement we need. Sometimes we have to remember that. Six, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. It's God's pattern and his way for his people to be rescued from judgment and exploitation. It's his pattern over the course of human history for his people to be rescued from judgment and exploitation. And then he goes on to give a major example of that. Verse 7, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. And it'd be really easy right now to just move past that, right? Oh, it's nice and Moses. Yeah, there's some old stuff that happened. But I want to take a little, a little, you know, parallel road here and talk about what is he remembering? What did he make known to Moses? What acts did he do for the people of Israel? And I'm going to go back to Exodus 6. Okay, so we're going to step out of Psalms. We're going to go to Exodus 6, 6 through 8. He says this, Say, therefore... To the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So what, Moses, what David's referring back to is, is the four promises that God made to his people in this passage. And, and God's ways don't change. So the promises he makes to the people in this passage, David knows those are promises that God would have for him then, right? And then we can know that at least in principle, the promises are promises we can have for us now. So let's look at these promises. Promise one is, I will bring you out. God moved the Israelites out from under slavery in the nation of Egypt. This was a physical move, right? The word sanctify means to set apart, right? To set apart from, to set apart to. He set them apart. He moved them out from under the oppression that they were under. They were powerless and they were helpless, and he rescued them from that. And today, okay, that's David is remembering, and today we can be rescued two, God rescues us out from under our oppression, which is sin. That's our oppression. Before we have a relationship with Jesus, there's no point in trying to be good enough. We're powerless to do so. It's a supernatural thing that has to be done. Once we trust Christ, place our faith in Christ, we receive the Spirit of God, and now we are empowered to do it. He, he does that supernaturally, right? It takes us from death to life, to now we're unable to do what he wants us to do in our strength to where we're able to do what he wants us to do in his supernatural strength. So he, he takes us out, okay? He actually brings us out. The second promise is, I will deliver you. He doesn't just leave us brought out. He doesn't just leave us with spiritual regeneration even or just this new life and this new opportunity. He keeps going. He says, I will deliver you. God brought the Egyptians out or the, the Israelites out from Egypt but they had a lot of habits, their thinking and their behavior. They learned a lot of bad habits while they were in bondage. And it took generations, well, it took decades, actually, for God to work those habits out of them before they actually stepped into their greatest, greatest purpose, right? And once we have Jesus, we, he wants to deliver us from all of the habits we picked up before we knew him and surrendered to him. We shouldn't accept them 
or believe that we're forever bound to them because God frees us from the habits, the sin, we established before our rescue. He frees us from those. Now, I don't want to place condemnation on you right now because you're like, oh my gosh, I should be free from all those things. Well, this isn't to place condemnation on you. This is to encourage you. How does God create this freedom? Over time, in a relationship with him and the people of God. God does this over time, an intimate relationship with God and the people of God. And if we build those disciplines into our life, we can expect progressive freedom over time. Scripture says, for freedom, Christ set us free. And it's important for us to partner in the people of God to participate in that process. And that's why we need to be in groups, right? The measure there is two-way conversation. You can't have two-way conversation right here. It needs to be two-way conversation and people you're in community with, and that's how we can step into that. But let's say he saves us and then we get freedom, and then he, he doesn't even leave it at that. He says, I will redeem you. Promise three is I will redeem you. God promises redemption or restoration back to our original intended purpose. If we uh, have a coupon and I go redeem the coupon, what do I get? I redeem the thing that that coupon was intended for. That's what God wants to do. God redeemed the Israelites. They were not designed to make mud bricks for a a pharaoh, for a king of Egypt. They were designed to live according to God's plan in the promised land, doing God's work. So he gives them purpose. God has redeemed you too. His promise is redemption. Here's how he does it today. For you to live with purpose, on purpose, and in for Christ. God reestablishes our purpose. God reestablishes our purpose. To live with purpose, on purpose, and in for Christ. And the problem with the world today, or I'm not a problem with the world today, but when you see people are desperate for purpose. We have kids in here, they're trying to figure out what it means to be a young man, what it means to be significant. I will tell you what it means to be significant. To live with purpose, on purpose, and in for Jesus Christ. That's what it means. You'll never want or lack from a place of purpose or significance if that's what we give our lives to. There's three really important days. The day you were born, the day you were reborn, and the day you discover why you were born and reborn. You're saved for something, not just from something. And that is what the third promise is about. One more promise, and then we're going to get back into the psalm, but we have to know what God's referring to here. Promise four, I will take you to be my people. God promised to take the Israelites from slavery, through freedom, get all the bad habits out of them, then into purpose, and then as they were discovering that purpose, he took them to be his people, plural. They're living purpose together in the promised land, and that's what he wants us to do now, to live his purpose together here and in eternity. And that includes reward. What's the reward? I don't have these verses on the screen. John 10.10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you may have life and life to the full. John 16.20, Jesus is talking. Until now you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will will receive and your joy will be complete. God makes joy possible. God actually promised joy to the Israelites. And we can expect joy, too, as we receive all of these promises. So your Grace Valley staff team has been spending a lot of time talking about this. And the whole group, every week, we're talking about this language. And and here are the four things that we've been talking about a lot. Rescue, freedom, purpose, and joy. These will be on the screen all four at once. Rescue, purpose, freedom, and joy. And those are the promises, the ways of God would say that the people of God have the opportunity to receive all of those promises. These are his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. These are his benefits. It may help you to remember his benefits that you haven't even received yet. It's like remembering the history of your future. To by faith believe that God wants these things. Maybe I don't even have them all yet. And if I will trust him by faith, I can get them. It's a supernatural thing, right? And it's not like a one and done achieved thing. I want to be real careful. This isn't a performance. This isn't a performance. But it's a partnership with God and the people of God to watch him live these things out in your life. 
This is to give you hope. Okay, now, in that context, those four things, the staff has been talking a lot about what does it mean to build a local gathering of people that's really good at helping people who are here and the people who aren't here yet receive those four promises. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about how big to make this place. Not once, staff meeting has been like, let's see how big we can make this thing. The conversation is about how can we help people be rescued? How can we help them find freedom? How can we help them find their purpose? And how can we help them experience the joy that God designed them for? That's the goal. Meet people in the valley. Walk them through these things. Be people of the valley. Reach back and find other people. This is what we're talking about. But side note here. This is what David's talking about in that one verse where he says to remember what he promised to Moses and the acts of the people of Israel. Okay. And so it makes sense to where he goes next. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he bring, nor will he keep his anger forever. Everything God does is designed for us to know and experience him. He's not going to constantly accuse us. He's not going to constantly accuse us because he wants a relationship with us. He sent Jesus so he doesn't have to constantly accuse us. He was the solution to all that. Verse 10, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. David saw this pattern even in the Old Testament. In the garden, he gave Adam and Eve clothing, a covering. He provided Abraham a substitutionary lamb so he didn't have to kill his son Isaac. He gave Noah an ark. He gave Israel the judges, and he eventually he would give us Jesus, and we can have that freedom. 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. God has always been merciful to those who recognize him as God, who recognize him as Lord and place their faith in him. 14, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He knows that we are fragile and must be handled with care, and he knows that we're needy. He knows that we can't do this stuff, guys. He knows that. He knows that we're needy and we need him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place knows it no more. You know, a flower pops up and it's pretty for a season, often a short season, but then the wind comes and dries it up and blows it away and it's gone. And that's how our life is here, which is why we need to continue to have this eternal perspective. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children's. These promises, these characteristics that David's remembering are multi-generational. Children's, children's, children's. The blessing moves forward there all the way into eternity to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Our role in that is simply surrender and trust. Surrender and trust. God's love is longer than the seasons of your life here. It's longer than the seasons of your children's and grandchildren's life. It lasts forever. So then what's the key then here to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments? What's the key to doing that for us today? John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you can, you've heard this about the salvation verse, but this is for life. Like this, this, if you want the four things, the only way is to say, Jesus, I can't bring those four things into my life. I need your help. I'm going to partner with you and your people to, to, in a messy, grace-filled way, walk through it. It's only through faith and surrender to Jesus. 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. I don't remember who said it, but I still like it. God made the universe and he made it his way. You may think you have a better way. Most people do today. But you don't have a universe. And we can get with the system or we can get less than what God wants for us to have. And as, wow, this is available, you see almost David's starting to feel it now. Look how he ends. Verse 20. 
Bless the Lord, O you his angels. Okay, he starts out by like, bless the Lord, O my soul. He's having to self-talk himself into praise. And then he ends it where he's like commanding the angels to praise God. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word. Obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. 22, bless the Lord, all his works in all places of dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He is now with enthusiasm blessing God. And this, this path, this process, this system is something I've observed in my life. So on this iPad or on my computer or on my phone, I, I have some software that syncs up all the way. And, and, and since about 2005, I've had the, the discipline of journaling. And since 2008, I've done it electronically. So I can go and, and look up and I can pull up. I have a, like an Evernote file where I have like March 2013. And then I'll journal daily for the month in that file. And then I can go back and look at it. And as I was preparing for this and as I was reflecting back to that morning when God first spoke to me through this psalm 14 years ago with Tim and Chris and I don't even remember who else was there, I was able to look at my journals. And, and, I, and I say this Humbly, but the vast majority of my journals begin with just the first sentence, Lord, I praise you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I worship you. And then it's like, help me. You know, like, it's a, and, and, so, and sometimes help me is first, okay? But, like, I was so excited to reflect back and say, wow, on the good days and the bad days, some, for some reason, I am trained to type that first pen. First sentence, I praise you, Lord. I worship you. And I can measurably see over the past 10 years where my mornings have stabilized. And I am not the, the, the up and down or, or, or that. Like, I wake up, and I even know this now, that now I think the hope I live with when I wake up, when I first put my head up off the pillow, is that I'm going to open my iPad and say, I praise you, Lord. And that makes everything better. And, and, and if we can develop the habit of praise, I mean, I do this every day, okay? <laughs> daily for me means almost daily, all right? Let's just, just to normalize that, right? But for years, it was exciting. And, and here are the benefits of praise just practically, right? Stability. We can have stability over our feelings. And, and, and it takes me off my throne and puts God on his, and it takes me out of feeling like I have to do this, and it helps me tell him I can't. And it signals dependence. And it helps God know, he knows he's first, but it helps God know that I know he's first. And using the model of David here, praise the Lord, I know this is better for me if I can start out by praising you. I know this is a good discipline, and I can say that I, I, I've experienced this difference in my life, right? So please pray for me this week because I'm about to have some bad mornings because I come and say, oh, I got, you know, like this, like I, I just, but that discipline is something I'd encourage you to maybe develop too. And it's always uncomfortable saying that because it's, it's something I didn't even realize until this takes a place. And sometimes that's the only sentence in the journal. I get distracted and I'm off. <laughs> so um, hopefully there's more than that. So there's two action steps for this week and we're wrapping up. The first action step is, would you find a way to develop a habit of praise? A new way to develop a habit of praise. I often do it intellectually. I have to type it out, write it out. For me, that's how I work. Some people are more musically inclined. You do it through music. You do it through song. Some people can do that. But if, but if you're not a journaler, I'm not talking about Dear Diary. But if you can slow your mind down enough to send it through your fingertips or on a pen to put it on a, on a screen or on a notebook, it does something inside of you. It allows you to, to self-talk in a way that gives you much more agency and much more autonomy and much more affluence over your mind and your feelings. And it sets us up better for the day. Plus, it blesses God. It just simply blesses us. And we know that God inhabits the praise of his people. It's a scripture. God inhabits the praise of his people. 
You're feeling far from God? Bless him. Praise him. Feeling down? Feeling discouraged? Feeling helpless? Feeling weak? Bless him. Praise him. Excited about the roof over your head? Bless him. Praise him. It's the powerful path forward. And the second thing I'd like to ask everybody to do is corporately this joy that God promises to us happens together. And we're together with the musicians and the worship leaders, and we're together today. And I'm going to just right now, on the heels of having a a theology of praise, I think theology and therapy go great together, right? Okay. And so my journal is some therapy, but the theology is praise works. Praise is a powerful path forward. Would you move during this response time from spectator to participator? Would you make the move? Forget what the people around you are thinking. Just make the move. They're not performing for you, right? They're just leading the worship. And, and somebody, if, if, if this can be a defining moment, a new surrender to just move from spectator to participator. In this song, and you're going to like the song. I know you know it. You'll, you'll figure it out real soon once they start singing it. Let me pray. Father, right now, uh, I pray for anybody in this room who who hasn't surrendered to you, who hasn't believed that your, your grace is enough for them through the life of Jesus, that they would, by faith, believe that they can have a relationship with you because of what Jesus they have to do it, God. And that on the heels of that, that they would surrender and praise you. And God, I pray for all of us that have become completely committed to being Christians, but have not been transformed by you that you would maybe use this moment in a small way to minister to them and to make yourself more real and more powerful to them. We pray all this in Christ's name.